Here we are in the book of Matthew, beginning of the New Testament. So I'm glad you're with us today. Uh, today, we're going to spend more time understanding first the book of Matthew itself and then getting into the first chapter. So if you haven't watched any of our other videos, we've just done the whole Old Testament recently as well. You can watch all those videos. Uh, realize we pull, I'm going to pull uh, from a lot of different sources. Uh, some Catholic or Protestant, some LDS, some secular, lots of different perspectives to try to understand a little more about these books. Now, the goal of these videos that I'm doing is to help you go deeper into the scriptures so that you don't just have to stay on the surface. People don't read the scriptures enough to get past the surface. So I want to help you to get past that surface, make it easier to get in. Because once you get in, then you can start to really study and understand the scriptures and the gospel better. So let's get started on this. Now, Matthew, while it is the first book in the New Testament, it is not the first book written for in, in the New Testament times. Uh, it's, there's, in fact, almost most of the Bible, most of the New Testament that we have today was written before this book of Matthew. Uh, so realize the book uh, the, that the the whole New Testament is not chronologically organized. It is organized around putting a chronology to the timeline of the gospel. So Christ and his teachings first, then the apostles second, basically. And then, of course, the apocryphal stuff at the end. So that's the reason it's set up the way it is, basically. Um, how the gospels got organized the way they are, I don't... I don't know for sure how, like, why Matthew was before Luke, because Luke spends a little bit more time on the birth of Christ. Uh, but uh, I don't know. There's there's probably a little bit more we can study. But again, I'm not trying to be super scholarly with this. Just trying to give you insight to let you dig deeper, basically help you find rabbit holes you can go down to keep learning and understanding the gospel more. So a couple things to understand about the book of Matthew. And if you haven't watched our introduction video to the New Testament. Watch that. We're going to answer answer a lot of questions and discuss a lot of things there that'll help you out. That's a framework for how we're looking at the New Testament. So the Gospel of Matthew. Okay, a couple things to understand about this. One is we have to realize now we a lot of scholars date the Book of Matthew to around eighty to ninety A.D. when it was written. There's a couple things we need to understand about this. Okay, that means okay if Matthew was alive. And probably around the age of 20-ish, maybe, when he met Christ and did things with Christ. Now, Christ was about 30 when he started his ministry and doing those things. Uh, he, Matthew, maybe would have been in early 20s, possibly. Let's, let's give Matthew the benefit of the doubt and say early 20s, okay, at the time that, that Christ was around. So when Christ died around 33 AD, Matthew maybe was 24, 25 years old, let's say, when, when Christ died, basically. That means if the book of Matthew was written in, let's say, 80 AD, okay, that means it was written 50 years after the death of Christ. That's at that earlier point, 80, okay? That means Matthew would have had been in his 70s when he wrote this book, if he wrote it himself. That's old. Now, I, if you got to the age of 70 during that time period, that was pretty darn good. You were a pretty healthy person to get to that point. Not a lot of people mean. I think the average age was around... 50 to 60. So you were considered really, really old by that time because usually a disease or a war killed you before you got too old, basically. Um, so Matthew had would have had to have lived a very long life in order to write it himself. Okay. Now we have to understand that that means, again, either he lived a super long time or maybe it wasn't Matthew that compiled it. Now we know, and if you watch The Chosen, you can see in there, you know, Matthew's writing stuff down on what Christ says. That is true. There's a good chance Matthew wrote a lot down. He was a pretty educated guy. Okay, He was the tax collector. So he had to know how to read and write and uh, do things. So he was a one of the more educated of the Jewish nation. Um, 
he worked for the Romans, which is why a lot of Jews saw him as a traitor to their nation, because the Romans were the ones that were collecting the taxes. He was just really smart and collect taxes. Now, the chosen, just I want to kind of put this out here. The chosen is presenting Matthew as autistic in their show. I have no idea if that's true or not. I don't know. I haven't seen any scholarly reports. I haven't really looked for scholarly reports to tell, is Ma was Matthew, could he be considered uh, somewhere on the autism spectrum? Uh, but they're portraying him that way. Uh, maybe that's a way that they are using to explain why Matthew was way more literate and understanding of numbers and things better. I'm not sure if, there, if there's truth behind that or not. It's an interesting point. Um, but we do know he's, he, Matthew is a pretty educated guy. So most likely, just looking at the averages of what's most likely to happen, most likely Matthew wrote a lot of stuff down about Christ. Maybe he tried to put some of it into a book, but it was somebody later who finished it. Maybe he had a book of teachings and ideas, maybe his own letters and things that he wrote as well, like Paul did. Uh, but then it was somebody later that compiled it. Now, the earliest manuscripts we have, this is according to the Protestant Bible, page seven, the earliest manuscript collection of the four gospels is from the late second century. So we're talking, when, when we say second century, that is the 100s AD. So around 180, 190 AD is the earliest manuscript. So we're still, we're not getting originals. We're getting copies of copies of the originals at best, if not copies of copies of copies of copies of the originals. So that's part of the problem we have with the New Testament is when they wrote this stuff down during the time of Christ, they didn't write down a lot. There's nothing written by Christ himself. We don't have any of those records if he did. Matthew probably wrote a bunch of stuff down, but we can't say he wrote a book himself. So somebody else later took the writings of Matthew, compiled it, and we know that the first out of the four Gospels was the book of Mark. Mark was the earliest Gospel written. And we see, and when you look at it scholarly, and we'll talk about some of these ideas as we go through the, the stories in the book of Matthew, that uh, there was a lot of reliance on the book of Mark when Matthew's Gospel came together. So Mark's Gospels first. Mark's not an original apostle at all. He's a follower of Peter, and he studies from Peter, gets oral traditions, puts it together. We'll, we'll talk about Mark when we get to his book. Uh, but then Matthew, whoever wrote Matthew, had a copy of the book of Mark and then used that to help out and then tried to correct some of the timeline issues that Mark's book had and add other things in. Now, Matthew is written... Not, again, not as a book. It was written as a letter to people. Matthew is writing to a Jewish group. He's, so he's taking the perspective of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the life and teachings of Christ, and he's putting a Jewish perspective on it. So he's thinking, what are stories? What are things that the Jews would see as a connection between their philosophy and ideas and what Christ life and teachings were about. That's where we get some connections. So we see in the book of Matthew, as he's writing to this Jewish population, he's trying to help this Jewish population accept and understand Jesus Christ. And so he's writing it in a way that would help Jews accept it. Okay, every gospel has a little bit different perspective or hermeneutic on the life of Christ. And we're going to see that play out as we go through these. Now, again, these videos are not to compare all the Gospels together to harmonize them. We're going to talk about each one individually as we go along. So that's, we're going to kind of stay with the what we have right here. So there's other videos. If you want more harmonization, in fact, I'd absolutely recommend uh, Jared Halverson's podcast, Unshaken. You can find him on podcast uh, sites as well as YouTube. And he does a lot of harmonizing the Gospels together, which is great. It's a really great perspective. Uh, we're not. We're going to kind of take each book as its own and talk about them and then discuss some of the comparisons as we go. So this is, this is just some important ideas for us to think about. Okay. Matthew is not the first gospel written. Uh, it was probably the second or third gospel written. Basically Matthew and Luke were similar in time frame. Uh, so it's a debate which one was written first, but they both use Mark as kind of a foundation and then they expound upon it from there basically. 
um, the the earliest writings, if you think about it chronologically, the early, some of the earliest writings are from the letters of Paul. In fact, here's a quote that I have. Uh, this comes from the book, Jesus Christ and the World of the New Testament, page 51. They say here, the letters of Paul are the earliest New Testament writings, and, and while they talk about Jesus' teachings, they do not give us a picture of who Christ was. Mark is the first of the Gospels and begins to change this through making a more biographical work of Christ. Matthew follows suit in creating a biography of the life of Christ. Matthew was originally written in Greek. It was written to defend the laws of Moses through the life of Christ. Uh, Papias, who is a, a, a supposed ancient historian guy, I don't think he was considered a, stor a historian at his time, but later, because he did a lot of writings, we see him as kind of a de facto historian, even though he's not 100% correct in his, te in his writings. Papias claims a person named Matthew wrote a gospel, but many church fathers think Papias is incorrect. It is thought that the tax collector Matthew wrote down a lot of things of Jesus, which were then combined into this book. Matthew chose to capture the misunderstanding of the Jews in his opening scenes by retail, retelling the birth stories and emphasizing that the first mortals to worship Jesus were foreigners. Those who should have known him did not, and in fact appear completely caught off guard by the birth, even when the celestial signs had been given. Matthew carried this theme throughout his gospel consistently, presenting Jesus' ministry and message as the fulfillment of Scripture. For Matthew, the emphasis lay in the fact that Jesus was the Messiah of the Old Testament, whose ministry had been clearly foreseen by the prophets. So the Jews are looking for this Messiah to save them, but they were looking for a political and military Messiah. If you watch the videos of the lesser prophets in the Old Testament, there's a lot about the second coming of Christ and, and things like that. And I think that's what was influencing the Jews of this time to look for, again, more of a political slash military Messiah. They weren't looking for a spiritual Messiah. And Christ came as a spiritual Messiah. And so Matthew, in writing to the Jews who were up in the, the outlying areas, so not so much at Jerusalem, but looking at the, the Jews that knew Greek that were out in the outlying areas, the diaspora, of Jews to help them see, look, Jesus Christ is the fulfillment of the Old Testament scriptures. He is the Messiah that the Jewish nation has been looking for. and But they missed it, basically. They didn't see and they didn't pull it together during his life. And so I want you to see this. You know, we need to uh, work on having Christ more in our life, basically. So the book of Matthew helps us understand the life of the Savior and contrast it with Judaism in an effort to help us see the church and gospel and the gospel. Christ was bringing with him, oh, the gospel Christ was bringing with him, sorry, missed a, per a period in there. Since having books were scarce, most people had to learn to memorize scripture and sermons. This book repeats important concepts to help the reader in understanding the teachings of Christ. Another point Matthew makes is to show Jesus as a new Moses through some of the experiences of Jesus that are parallel to the life of Moses. So in the book of Matthew, we're going to see parallels between Moses' life and Jesus' life, showing in a way Jesus is the new Moses. Okay, Moses was a type of Jesus. We talk about that when we get into Genesis and Exodus in the Old Testament, how Moses was, was a a precursor, a symbol of the coming Messiah who would redeem his people, save them out of not just bondage and slavery, but the bondage of sin and would redeem them and bring them to a promised land or Zion. That's what Moses did. And that's what Jesus does spiritually for us, basically. Now, it, let's talk for just a second about the title of this book, because you might be saying, well, but this is titled the Gospel of Matthew or the Gospel according to St. Matthew. This title was added to the book in the second or third century as they tried to associate authorship to the book. So at the time this was written, it wasn't associated with Matthew. It was probably known loosely as possibly a part of the writings of Matthew or based on some of the writings of Matthew, but it wasn't known as the book of Matthew until a couple hundred late years after it was written, basically. Uh, it says, we do not have clear evidence it was the disciple Matthew that wrote this book, although he is seen as the one who compiled the stories and possibly later scribes created the book at a later date from his writings. 
it is heavily influenced by the writings of the book of Mark, which had been written earlier. Now, that's something that we had talked about as well uh, just a couple of minutes ago. So hopefully that helps you put a kind of a perspective on Matthew. Okay, we know there was an apostle named Matthew, and he was a very literate person, uh, and he probably compiled a lot of stuff about the life of Christ. We can't say he wrote a book. Uh, and because there's a couple hundred years difference between what we have for the Gospel of Matthew and the life span of the Apostle Matthew. And the book doesn't start with his original name on it either. So we think these are the writings that were heavily influenced by Matthew, but we also see they were influenced by Mark and possibly some other traditions in there. So there's some challenges that we see that's coming along with this to say definitively this is the absolute gospel of Mark or Matthew that Matthew wrote about himself and everything. We can't say that. Uh, it doesn't mean that what we're learning in this book is less important. Matthew teaches us some very important things about the life of Christ as he compares Christianity and Judaism together, basically. So it's important. The message is important, okay? How we got the message is a little fuzzy, but that doesn't mean the message isn't true or have truth in it. So just just to understand that, okay, the Bible has challenges and problems. It's a, it is an imperfect book that was put together by imperfect people. That doesn't mean it's wrong or false. It just means we need to be willing to be more thoughtful in what we think about and understand in this book. Very important for us to look at. So with that all in mind, let's get in and start into chapter one of the Gospel of Matthew. So this is, again, beginning with the birth of the Savior is what he's going to start with, kind of showing a timeline. Mark, who is the earlier Gospel, starts at the at the baptism of the Savior, basically. So he does an intro to with, with John uh, the Baptist and then gets into the baptism and then starts Christ's ministry. So Mark starts later and only focuses on basically the three years of Christ's ministry for the most part that he does. So Matthew, as well as Luke, said, no, we're going to tell more of the story. So we're going to go back to his birth and then we're going to move forward from there, basically. And so that's, that's what we see with these two other Gospels that came after Mark. So chapter 1, verse 1 here, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. This is important. This is a very important start for us, okay? So this is going to give us genealogy of Jesus Christ. This is very valuable because if you know your Old Testament, you know that there was revelations given to Abraham that... A Messiah would come through his line, and David, King David, was told that his line would stay on the throne, and a great king would come to save the people and, and take care of the people that would come through his line as well. So Matthew's going to lay out the argument from a genealogical standpoint that Jesus Christ fulfills those prophecies, and that he is of the lineage of David, okay? which makes him Jewish. Okay, Christ is a Jew. Christ is, is of a Jewish lineage. He's not a white person. So we have to we just have to understand that. That's a lot of people, especially when you get more into Protestantism, really have this idea that Jesus Christ is a white white person, a white man, like like me, a complexion like my I would have. He's not. He is Middle Eastern. He is Jewish. He would probably not have as white of a complexion as I do he would have a darker complexion because he's more Middle Eastern. So we have to be, we have to just realize that, okay, he's Jewish. He's coming from Jewish heritage for as far as DNA is concerned, okay, with, with his mother Mary uh, as well. So let's look at this. Now, there's going to be, I'm just going to show you here, okay, there's going to be two genealogy lists that we're going to look at. So I want you to just be aware of this ahead of time, okay? There's, impor there's importance between these two. Purpose of the two genealogies, one is to show the genealogy from Christ to David. We're going to connect those two together. The second one is to show the dependency from Christ to Abraham as well. And the third is to clarify the meaning of the title Messiah. To show us that Christ is the Messiah, the one who will come save his people, basically. 
So this is this is a very important thing for us to consider. Uh, now we're going to get into this in just a second, go through all of these verses as it starts off with Abraham. So, so he so in verse one he says we're going to talk about the generation of Jesus Christ, and we're going to start at Abraham and work our way up to Jesus Christ. That's verse two. Abraham begat Isaac. Isaac begat Jacob. Jacob begat Judas, who's where all the Jews come from, and his brethren. So that phrase and his brethren delineates the other eleven tribes. So there's Judas, and then there, there are all the other tribes, but we're not focusing on them. We're focusing only on Judas, so the tribe of Judah, basically. Now, uh, Jesus in James E. Talmadge in his book, Jesus the Christ, uh, page 86, gave us some good information to talk about all of these. So I want to share this with you, because he's kind of he adds a little bit more of the context to these verses. He says, Abraham and Sarah were not able to have children. After the Lord made promises unto them concerning their posterity, Sarah conceived Isaac. Abraham was a hundred years old. During Isaac's early years, Abraham was commanded to sacrifice him. An angel stopped Abraham right before Isaac was killed. Abraham and Isaac were blessed greatly. It was prophesied that a nation shall come forth through Isaac. When it came time for Isaac to marry, Abraham did not want him marrying a Canaanite. Abraham sent his eldest servant into his home country of Mesopotamia, city of Nahor, to look for a wife for Isaac. So that would bring somebody that was related, like a a niece or a distant relative of Abraham, to come in, so kind of keep it in the family. The servant went and brought back Rebekah. Rebekah conceives Jacob, who later becomes known as Israel. Jacob has the twelve sons by four women. Judah is the fourth son and was conceived by Leah. Judah had two sons by a Canaanite woman. He even had a wife picked for the oldest of the two, whose name was Ur. God killed Ur because of his wickedness, so his brother Onan took her, Tamar, to wife according to the law. Okay, so this is this is getting into uh, understanding a little bit further down, remember? So if, if one, if a man gets married to a woman, this is Old Testament, and that man dies that man's younger brother then marries his sister-in-law and raises the first few kids they have are raised in behalf of the name of his older brother, basically. That's where we're at. Now, Ur, if you go into your Old Testament, you'll learn about this. Ur didn't like this because he knew the first couple of kids he had by Tamar would not be his. And so he... The simplest way to put to, to say it is he pulled out and wouldn't get her pregnant. And so because he was violating the laws, God killed him. So God killed Ur because of his wickedness. So his brother Onan took Tamar to wife according to the law. Onan knew that if they have children, they wouldn't be called called his, so he wouldn't allow Tamar to become pregnant either. Now realize this is these are the sons of Judah. Okay, this is sons of Judah. So verse 3, and Judas begat Perez and Zerah of Thamar. Okay, and Perez begat Ezra, and Ezra begat Aram. Now this is important. So these are three sons that Judah has. The first two have died. One, we don't know what happened to him. The second one, God killed, according to the history. The third one basically realizes he doesn't want to do it. So God kills him too. Onan gets killed. So Judah... Okay, so he's he has so Judah has one more son, but he is really young, too young to get married. So Judah, the dad, says, "Okay, Tamar, this is a problem. How about you go back and live with your parents while my son gets older? When he gets into his more mature age, where he can then get married, then I'll come get you, and you can come marry him, and and continue the traditions forward as we're supposed to do according to the law." So that's what happened. So Judah told Tamar to remain a widow at her father's house until his third son, oh, his third son was old enough. It should have been fourth son, actually. There's three in there. Anyways, uh, it was probably third son. So third son was told old enough to be married. When Judah's son Shelah was old enough, Judah did not give Tamar. So here's the challenge. Judah went back to look for Tamar, okay? And uh, on his way there, he happens to see prostitute or a woman he thought was a prostitute and uh so he decides oh i'm gonna go hang out and have a little tryst for a second and then go finish looking for my daughter-in-law little did he know that 
that woman was his daughter-in-law. She recognized him. And she asked him, hey, what is my payment for, for my services that I've provided for you? And so he gives her a staff. And then she shows up. She, he, he goes, Judah goes to find Tamar at, at her parents' house. And her parents are like, we don't know where she's at. She's not home today. Oh, okay, well, tell her I need her. Come have, you know, come have her come to my house. Okay. So when Tamar gets home, she eventually makes it over to Judah, to his house. And, and Judah's like, what the heck? You're pregnant. What's going on? And she says, the man that owns this staff is the father. And then he realizes, oh, crap, that's my staff. Oh, no. So Judah got his daughter-in-law pregnant. And you can go read the details of all this in the Old Testament. Um, and so that's the challenge. So Tamar kind of becomes a wife for Judah, in essence, basically. And that's where Ezra or Perez and Zerah of Tamar. So they, Judas, so Judah and Tamar hook up, and that's where Perez and Zerah come from, basically in verse 3. So uh, let's see, Judah saw a woman, let's say I just went through all that. So now we get to Perez beget Hezram and Hamul, Hezram beget Aram or Ram. Uh, Aram begat Aminadab, and Aminadab begat Nasson or, or Nashon. The, some of the words, the spelling changes over, over time. Nasson was a prince of the children of Judah. So now we're getting verse 4. Aram begat Aminadab, and Aminadab begat Nasson, and Nasson begat Solomon. Solomon, basically. So we look at this. Uh, I just lost my spot. Hold on one second. Let's see. There we are. Nasson was a prince of the children of Judah. He was appointed by Moses. All the tribes had one man as head of the tribe. So Nason in verse 4 was the head of the tribe of Judah, basically. He was appointed by Moses. I just read that they each pulled their own tribe and found out the number of men 20 years or older that were able to go to war. Nason begat Salmon. Salmon begat Booz of Rechab or Boaz, if you remember from the story of Ruth. Okay. Boaz took Ruth as his wife. You can read about her stuff in, in the Old Testament too. Uh, and she begat Obed. Obed begat Jesse. Jesse begat David, King David. Okay, so now we're, we're down here. So verse 5, and Salmon begat Booz of Rechab. Booz begat Obed of Ruth. Obed begat Jesse. Ruth was given a promise because of her faithfulness to Boaz and her, her righteousness that she would be a part of that blessed lineage, basically. And so she was. So her grandson, Ruth's, Ruth's uh, great-grandson, sorry, because Ruth begat Obed, Obed begat Jesse, Jesse begat King David. Okay, so now we're down to King David. So verse 6, and Jesse begat King David, and David the king begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Urias. If you remember that story, David was the king, he was doing really well, and he went through all that problems with Saul and things like that, and then he eventually became king after Saul. Remember, the, the Judah went to uh, Samuel, the prophet, and said, hey, we want a king because everybody else has a king. We want to be cool like the neighbors. And he says, no, you don't want a king. That's a bad idea. And they said, no, we really want a king. Go ask God if he'll give us a king. So Samuel went, okay, fine, I'll go ask God. So he went and asked God. God said, Okay, if they want a king, give them a king. And Samuel went, are you serious? Really? And God said, yeah, let's give them what they want, not what they need. So they, so Samuel picked out Saul. God's like, go, go get Saul. Saul was a big, mighty man. And so everybody's like, yeah, this guy looks good. And he's got muscles and he's so cool. He's going to be the king we want. But inside, Saul was a flipping mess. The dude had all kinds of mental problems anxiety disorders, all kinds of issues. So he turned into a bad king. He looked good on the outside, but inside he was a terrible person, which was the exact opposite of David. David was a small, scrawny kid, but he had the heart and mind to be king. So he had what it took inside. Outside, he didn't look like a king. And so remember, this is David, of course, with David and Goliath as well, that whole story. Uh, David did fight off a lion shortly before he fought Goliath, and nobody believed David would stand a chance against Goliath. Here's this scrawny young kid against the largest man that they had probably seen in a long time. And what did David do? Took him down. David used his faith in God 
to help him, not as strengthen his arms. So David becomes king. Eventually, he's hanging out on the roof of his, his house. He happens to look over because most of the courtyards and other areas were pretty open back then as well. Sees this beautiful woman taking a bath and rather than going, ah, that's, uh, I shouldn't look at that and walk away, he enjoys the view. Then he says, I want to have her as a concubine with me. I want to sleep with her. So remember they set it up. She comes in to the castle. She gets, uh, she's, you know, David sleeps with, with her. And, uh, but she's the wife of um, Uriah. That's the problem. Okay. So that's Bathsheba was her name, by the way. Sorry. Uh, Uriah was off fighting war. He was a valiant soldier. David thinks, I'm just going to have a one night stand with his wife, send her home. No big, no big deal. It'll be fine. Well, then she comes back saying, guess what? I'm pregnant. So David goes, crap. Uh, there's now evidence of my sins. And so now I've got to do something about this. So he says, Hey, Uriah, come back. Give me a report. Uriah comes back, says, Oh yeah, the war's doing this. We're doing all right. We're fighting over here. It's working out. And he says, okay, great, Uriah. How about you go home and spend some time with your wife now that you're here? hoping that he will have some sex with his wife and then be able to justify the baby on Uriah, her pregnancy, basically. Uh, well, Uriah says, you know what? My men are fighting and living in trenches. I'm going to go sleep outside the city wall, uh, the, uh, the castle wall, basically. I, can't, I shouldn't live any higher up than my men are because uh, he's so valiant and true to his men. So Uriah never goes home. So David's like, crap, now what do I do? And so he sends Uriah back to the front and he tells the other leaders, I want you to go into a hot battle and then I need you to retreat and leave Uriah by himself. So he betrays Uriah. Uriah dies in battle, basically with his friends pulling away from him at the king's request. And so then David can now marry Bathsheba and take her as wife to, to deal with this. So she gives birth to Solomon, basically. So Solomon comes along, verse 7, Solomon begat Roboam, and Roboam begat Abia, and Abia begat Asa. So in this time frame, this is a key moment in, in the uh, Israelite history here. Okay, The key moment here is Solomon doesn't just have Roboam. Now, of course, we know Solomon had like hundreds of women that he slept with. Uh, terrible idea. And he has, uh, there's Rehoboam, and there's Jeroboam, they're brothers. I don't think they're twins, but they're brothers. And they both kind of claim, they want to have claim to the throne. And so they end up dividing the kingdom. And this is where the division between the north and the south come in. Rehoboam gets into power and Rehoboam goes to the, to the priests, the advisors of his dad, and says, hey, what, what are some things I should do to, to build this kingdom up and do better? And the priest told him, you know what would be great? Your dad taxed the heck out of people. Let's lower taxes. Let's make life a little less burdensome on these people. And Rehoboam said, oh, that's interesting. So he went and talked to his buddies. And his buddy said, dude, no, you need to tax them more to make yourself more wealthy. And so he said, okay, I'll do that. So he taxes the people more to bring more wealth to himself. So the government's becoming a bigger burden on the people. The people hate this. And so they want to revolt against him. And Jeroboam, his brother, is like, dude, you're, you're screwed. This is bad. I'm going to try to take over. And they end up splitting. And so Jeroboam leaves the city of Jerusalem and takes 10 of the 12 tribes with him. So Benjamin and Judah stay in Jerusalem. The others leave. That's the division of the northern kingdom, Samaria, and the southern kingdom of Judah. Basically, Israel and Judah. That's when that split happens. Okay? So that's what's going on at this time. Now we see... In uh, verse 8, Asa begat Jehoshaphat, Jehoshaphat begat Joram, Joram begat Osias. And Jehoshaphat was a righteous, pretty benevolent guy. Okay, He was a really good guy, very prosperous. Uh, he is, uh, he, in fact, he combines with the northern kingdom for a bit to go after and fight Moab. Uh, he did really good. But he dies. His son Jehoram reigns. Jehoram was wicked, like the house of Ahab. Jehoram was diseased because of his wickedness, and he dies. So Ozias takes over, or Ahaziah, so this is Second Chronicles 22. He lived like Ahab too, which is wicked, okay? So we get these, we get kind of a couple wicked, then a righteous king, then a couple wicked, and then a righteous king. It's kind of the pattern. Uh, and then 
this is a weird time as well as we get into this this point here because Ahaziah dies in the battle by Jehu and Ahaziah's mother decides to take over. So she destroys all the royal seed of Judah and she reigns. She reigns for seven or eight years. Then Jehoiada, the priest, reveals Joash as king at age seven. So this is the challenge we see in this time frame in here. And so Joash, so when she goes and kills everybody, basically, so that she, so there is no more descendants. She's the only living heir of the previous king. And so she becomes basically the ruler. So Athaliah, I think was her name. She takes over the kingdom, basically. Uh, and if this sounds like a total soap opera drama, it is. The Old Testament, you can go read the details in the Old Testament. It's really fascinating. I'm trying to do the Cliff Notes version. Uh, so, let me see, I just lost my spot again. Okay, Athaliah eventually is killed. Joash begins his kingship in righteousness, then falls into jo idolatry. Joash was barely born when Athaliah killed the royal royalty of Judah. Joash was preserved. Uh, so now he was preserved by his aunt Jehoshabeth. And so this is where we get some weird parts happening. Okay. Now in verses eight and nine, we see a difference from the Old Testament. The Old Testament has a few rulers of Judah. Matthew does not have. So at this point, the Old Testament tells us there were a bunch more people that were the king of Israel that should be in this genealogy. Matthew cuts them out. And doesn't put them there. Now, this is an important thing for us to look at. Why does Matthew eliminate some of the, the genealogical record here? He's not being 100% accurate. Okay? And you can go compare these. Go look it up in Kings and Chronicles. You can see the history. And then come look at Matthew's genealogy, and you'll see it's different. He's cut several people out. Here's the thing. Old te Let's see. Um, this is the challenge here. Is Matthew's trying to show... A perfection between like Abraham to David to the Messiah to Christ so he wants to say there's only X number of generations between each and he, it's an equal distance generations the only way Matthew could do that to show some symmetry in this genealogy this perfectness between Abraham and David and Jesus was to basically cut a bunch of people out of the record so it looked good so again, Matthew is not trying to be 100% accurate. Matthew is trying to, or the, I should say the book of Matthew, is trying to show like, a, like there were so many generations from Abraham to David and then so many generations from David to Jesus to show a symmetry, basically to prove that Jesus is the Messiah. Now granted, we could look at this and say, okay, it's not 100% accurate. It isn't. So... He's trying to kind of fit the history into a predetermined box to make it make a better case that Jesus is the Messiah. Now we know Jesus is the Messiah, but he's using kind of a false. He's kind of skewing the data to be more convincing that Jesus is the Messiah. So that's part of the problem that we have. This is we talked about this in the in the introduction to the New Testament that the New Testament isn't hundred percent accurate, and this is Matthew chapter one shows us this okay so this is part of the problem we have here okay now as we continue on uh, Ezekiel begat Manassas this is verse 10 Manassas begat Ammon Ammon begat Josias Josias begat Jeconias and his brethren at about the time they were carried away to Babylon so this is Josias is the Josiah that had the reforms that's the beginning of the book of Jeremiah and then they Jeconias and his brethren were carried to way captive into Babylon as well. They're the ones that uh, go in the first uh, first exile. There were three of them, basically. They're, that's the first exile off. So verse 12, and after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconias begat Salathiel, Salathiel begat Zorobabel. Zorobabel was the governor of Israel after the exile. So 70 years later, he becomes Zerubbabel, basically, is another way to say his name. He's the governor of Israel. He's the line uh, that stays. Okay, the line actually got preserved through the Babylonian conquest. Just before then, as a series falling apart, you know, there's a change of who was king. And so when Babylon came through, they took the king and they moved him to Babylon, Babylon for exile, put their own king up. That was King Zedekiah, who then later was killed and all of his family was killed. Uh, 
so, but there was a preservation through that. So we learn about that in the, as we go through the book of Jeremiah. Preservation of, of the Davidic line. So now Zerubbabel's back. Zerubbabel begat Ab Abiud, and Abiud begat Eliakim. Eliakim begat Azor. Azor begat Zadok. Zadok begat Akim. Akim begat Eliud. So this is now, we're getting through the generations of people during the intertestamental period. Uh, Eliud begat Eliezer. Eliezer begat Mathan. Okay, now El this is, Mathan begat Jacob. Now Eliezer took to wife Dibath, the daughter of Tola, and begat by her Matan. Matan took wife to wife Sebrath, the daughter of Phineas, and begot by her two sons at one conception. So twins, Jacob and Yonaker. Jacob took to wife Hadbeth, the daughter of Eliezer, and begat by her Joseph. Okay, this is from the book of the Cave of Treasures, which is an apocryphal writing that's giving us a little bit more detail of this grouping here of genealogy in verse 15. Uh, Yo Yoan Akur took Dinah, the daughter of Hadok, uh, and begat by her Mary, of whom was born the Christ. So when we look at verse 16, Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary. So the book of Cave of Treasure is trying to show Mary is, this is Mary's genealogy, and it's not 100% accurate. This is Joseph's genealogy. The husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. So, and there's other ones. The book of the bee is another apocryphal writing that has a little bit different perspective on this as well. Uh, but here's the thing to look at, okay? is this is telling us the genealogy of Joseph. Now, you may say, wait a minute here. Wasn't Mary a virgin? Mary and Joseph aren't the reason Jesus is around. Mary and God were the reason Jesus was, because wasn't it like the whole idea of the conception and things? That is, so here's the thing to realize, okay? Joseph was seen as the biological father of Jesus, for a while, they, they, when the claims came out that he was conceived differently, then that changed a little bit. But this is showing Joseph. Here's the thing, okay? Joseph's married to Mary. Mary's first son would be seen as an heir to Joseph. This genealogy shows that Joseph, if the kings had not been destroyed, that that line of kings had not gone away, Joseph could possibly have been the king of Judah. And thus his son would have been the king of Judah. So showing that Joseph was of the right lineage to allow his son, even though it is technically a stepson, to be the king of Israel. So he's trying to, Matthew's trying to literally portray that out, basically. That's what we see here. Uh, so verse, this is now verse 17, we're, we're, this is going to talk, this is Matthew explaining that whole concept of symmetry and generations. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And from David until the carrying away into captivity of Babylon are 14 generations. And from the carrying away of Babylon into Christ are 14 generations. Sorry, I forgot that. So it is Abraham to David, to David to Babylonian exile, from Babylon exile to Christ. They each are 14 generations. He wants to again make a Simple, easy way to think about this, to show Christ is the Messiah through genealogy. That's the challenge with this, is it doesn't, act, the actual history doesn't work out that way. It still shows he is the Christ. He still has that right to rule in, the, in Judah, but it's not quite as symmetrical as Matthew wants it to be, basically. Uh, so this, this is a challenge that he's had. So again, we're, we're already into a historically inaccurate time in the first chapter of the New Testament. Uh, and there's a lot of commentary on this, a lot of things we can look at to understand this a little bit, you know, how this works. Again, I'm not trying to get too deep into it, but give you some ideas. I'm going to put some more quotes in the uh, notes. So look in the comment, and look just above the comment section of the video, and you'll see some more notes. In fact, there's a good chance we're going to have to put all this into our blog post with a link. So look in the description for the link to the blog post to get more details on this. Verse 18, now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When as his mother Mary was a spouse to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. So Mary is probably from Nazareth. A lot of scholars believe that she's from there. 
and lived with her parents before meeting Joseph. She is present for many of Jesus' miracles and is also there at his crucifixion. She is mentioned in Acts at a meeting of the apostles, in fact. There is a story that she might have been a Nazarite or a woman sworn to celibacy and temple service. So this is she was given as a young girl, as a Nazarite, so she was dedicated to serving in the temple, which means she would be a nun, basically. Uh, this is kind of a simple way to think about it. Uh, but then she suddenly shows up pregnant. She's, she's pregnant. And so Joseph was one of the priests at the temple. And so he said, okay, fine, let's, I will marry you to, you know, kind of justify this. Because if suddenly a celibate young woman gets pregnant, there's a problem that she would be killed, basically. Uh, that was punishable by death, basically. So uh, Joseph is one of the temple priests. He agrees to marry her to help legitimize that, that pregnancy out. So what he's going to show, what Matthew's book is going to talk about here, is showing that the time between engagement and the wedding is when Mary was found to be pregnant. Because in Jewish tradition, when you get engaged, you don't, you have to be real careful. Like there's, you don't, you can't do anything, you know, you've got to be careful on your intimacy and connections. And you kind of stay apart for a while before you get married, basically. Uh, so this would have been a time that the couple were apart. That's the time when she's discovered she's pregnant is when they're apart basically so that's the thing his she was a spouse to joseph before they came together she was found with child of the holy ghost so they were they were going to get married and then she gets pregnant uh, so here's a quote from the new testament study manual that says here marriage between a young man and a young woman was arranged and agreed to by the heads of respective families usually the fathers once a prospective wife had been identified by the groom's father or family head, negotiations were begun. They focused on, but were not limited to, the size of the bride price, a kind of dowry in reverse, paid by the groom's father or family head to the bride's family. Once the marriage was agreed upon, the wedding consisted of two stages, betrothal, which is also called a spousal, and a wedding ceremony. Betrothal was legally and religiously more significant than the subsequent marriage ceremony after which the couple began living together. Betrothal was regarded as the final part of a solemn covenant. It carried the force of a covenant to be honored between God-fearing parties. Though betrothed couples were legally regarded as husband and wife, the time, between the time of betrothal and the wedding ceremony, a strict code of chastity was enforced. So they're betrothed, they're engaged, so strict chastity falls in, and then Mary's bound to be pregnant. So right around that time, whether it was right after that or whether she was pregnant before, and so that's why they're getting married, there's some arguments either way on that one. But that's what's happening, basically. So, verse 19, Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. Now, here's what's interesting, okay? Uh, other translations show, or righteous, when it says just, uh, he would be following the law of Moses by saying, dude, so let's say you're, you're getting married. Okay. And the wife says, Hey honey, I got to let you know I had an affair. Legally, he could take her to the public square, basically strip her naked in front of everybody and say, here's my wife. Somebody else has already uncovered her nakedness. So it's going to be covered for everybody. She needs to be killed. And they would stone her and kill her. Basically that was, that was capital punishment back then. Uh, so he's faced with a dilemma here. His bride is pregnant and not by him. The law says to make her public example, but he does not want to. Joseph's a nice guy. Joseph has a heart and he's a thinking man. He doesn't want to just get so prideful and in his own mind that he just kicks her out and doesn't want anything to do with her. He is trying to work with her on this. Now, this is before the vis visions, visitations and things, okay? Uh, now she's probably been visited because she was visited before it happened and then she gets pregnant and then she's like, talks to Joseph about it. And then Joseph gets his vision later as well. Uh, and so this is the thing, verse 20, but while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee, Mary, thy wife for that, which is conceived in her is of the Holy ghost. So this is part of his visitation here coming in. So 
this is happening. And then he realizes who she got pregnant by, basically. Verse 20, 21, and she shall bring forth a son and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. Okay, now this is an important thing to consider, okay? Jesus, the name means salvations, which fits with what he's going to do. Okay, this is important. Now, Jesus is also Joshua as well, okay? You say it Jesus in Spanish. Jesus is also Joshua. It, for like Old Testament, that's they, they come from the same root. Uh, in fact, there's a Syriac man, manuscript of the New Testament. And he says, for he will save the world from its sins, not just his people. This may have not been popular back then, since it would mean Jews would be forgiven and saved too. What we, what we have might be more of an anti-Jewish interpretation to say he's going to save his people, but not everybody, basically. So that's, verse 21 is a bit of a contradiction in understanding that, you know, we think of Jesus as saving everybody, but verse 21 says he's going to save his people from their sins, not everybody else. So there's a, a challenge in how that was interpreted. Um, so again, Joshua is the English version of Jesus, basically. Uh, Yeshua would be the Hebrew version as well, which means Jehovah saves. Okay, Jehovah is the God of the Old Testament name. And the long form of the name Yehoshua means Jehovah is salvation. So both forms of the name bear witness of the identity and mission of Jesus Christ. Who was Jehovah in the pre-mortal life? Matthew described the Savior's mission of salvation by declaring he shall save his people from their sins. So verse 21 again is showing Jesus is the Messiah. Even his name depicts that. Uh, verse 22, now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet saying. Now this is a phrase, verse 22 is a common phrase we're going to see through Matthew. He's going to say this a lot. This was to fulfill, this is in fulfillment of this prophecy. So the prophecy is in verse 23. Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Now, here's what's interesting about this verse, okay? This is quoting the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. If you want to see more on this, go watch that video on Isaiah chapter 7 uh, to understand more of the translation ideas from there. Here's what's interesting about this, okay? This quote we have in the Gospel of Matthew is quoting a Greek version of Isaiah. He's not quoting a Hebrew version of Isaiah which would be more of an original version of Isaiah. He's quoting a Greek version, basically, when the scholars look at the languages. Okay, the Hebrew version describes that the young woman is already pregnant, where the Greek puts it still in the future. There's a bit of a change in that. The word for the young woman is translated as virgin, parthenos. So the only way Matthew makes sense is if he is quoting a Greek version of Isaiah. So he's probably writing in Greek, and not Hebrew. That's part of the reason they believe that Matthew was written in Greek originally, because he's using this these interpretations and ideas. So if you want to get more on this, go watch Isaiah chapter seven video to see more about this. This is the this is again saying, "Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, named Emmanuel." In Isaiah chapter seven, Isaiah had a prophecy about his wife having a son. And that was a type and a symbol of what was to come in the New Testament times with Christ. So Matthew is drawing from Isaiah to prove that how the birth of Christ came about fulfills Old Testament prophecy. Scholars do debut, they, you know, they kind of go back and forth on that, debate that basically. Uh, how does that really work out? But uh, so watch that video on Isaiah 7 to get more on that one. Now, verse 24. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him and took unto him his wife. So Joseph said, okay, I will marry her and do it. So he didn't kick her out. He, he still married her. Uh, verse 25, and he knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. 
So that's important. They they didn't have any intimate relations until after their marriage. So they fulfilled their obligations, and then they had that later. Okay, and after she had she had given birth to Jesus, basically. So Mary's probably about forty four or five months pregnant around the time that they get married, uh, and so they wait, and then and then they can come together. Now, there's something that's important to think about, right? I want to bring up with this, okay? There is a concept in Christianity called the Immaculate Conception, more of a Catholic-type idea than, than Protestant idea. Uh, a lot of people believe the Immaculate Conception talks about the virgin birth of Christ. It is not the virgin birth of Christ. Immaculate Conception talks about the birth of Mary. You see, there's a, there's a dilemma that we have throughout history here, okay? Because through the years, uh, like the 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th centuries, as, as Catholicism is growing, Christianity is spreading. They're trying to define their truths and ideas. You know, there's the Orthodox Church growing in the East and South and things. The Europe is being, you know, is taken over by Roman Catholicism. Uh, eventually, we have the Church of England and other groups that break off there as well. There was this idea called original sin. And original sin means because Adam and Eve were sinful and they were kicked out of the Garden of Eden, they were they had a sin that they that's what got them kicked out, and they they kept that sin retained that sin in mortality. That sin was then transferred to their children. So every child born to Adam and Eve were born already connected with a sin. Basically, they were born into sin by default. And so they that's this a common philosophy, okay? Original sin. That's what it means. And so all of their kids, which is all the rest of us, are not, we are born by default into sin. So we're not born holy, we're born into sin. This gives a problem though. This philosophy gives a problem because if every human born is born into sin, wouldn't that mean Jesus was born into sin? That's the problem. So if Mary, who's the mortal mother of Jesus, was born into sin, wouldn't that sin transfer to her son? Even though he is father, technically was heavenly father, basically God. So the idea of the Immaculate Conception started to come around because we couldn't have a philosophy that Christ was born into sin. We had to have him be perfect. And so they came up with this idea that there was some crazy miracle by Mary's parents that when she was born, when Mary was born, she somehow escaped original sin. I still have no idea how this works out. I haven't done too deep into it. If you know and want to put it in the comments, feel free to. So Mary was suddenly no longer born into sin by a miracle. She was born immaculately. She had no sin. And so then her children would have no sin, which is Jesus. Now, there are people that say that she stayed a virgin for the rest of her life, but verse 25 says otherwise, uh, and uh, that she didn't have any other kids, although the Bible tells us otherwise, that she did have kids out after Jesus. Um, so there's still some discrepancies and challenges in that as well. Uh, but that's where Immaculate Conception comes from, is this idea that when Mary was freed miraculously at birth from original sin so that her son would not confer original sin either and could be born perfect. So that's just an interesting idea from Catholicism from the history that, uh, that sometimes will come into play with this idea of the birth of the Savior. So sorry this video is a little long, but we had a ton to talk about. I hope it's been insightful and informative for you. I'd love to learn from you in the comments what you think about the video. What, what did you like about it? What did you learn? Uh, and then let's jump over to the next chapter as we continue to move forward.